everyone, and welcome to another Century Guild Salon. Tonight, Thomas Nagovin and I are going to be discussing our The Art of Dare Orchidine Garden book series. And this covers the artwork and short stories from the German fantasy and horror magazine, The Dare Orchidine Garden, um, which was published from 1919 through 1921. And um, I'm actually going to introduce Thomas now. Hello there. Hello. <laughs> Fancy meeting you here. Yes, once again. <sighs> so we, once again, if, if this is your first time joining us or you're coming back, um, regardless, we love making each salon a community discussion. So please share your questions and any observations you have in the chat or the comment section, <clears throat> depending on where you're tuning in from. And we'll be looking at those as the hour proceeds and we'll discuss them. So without further ado, for tonight's salon, we're actually going to be doing something a little different. I'm delighted to introduce that we have a very special surprise guest with an extensive and inspiring knowledge of the macabre and the fantastic in Weimar, Germany. Uh, our guest used that knowledge to create one of the most celebrated and respected movies depicting the Weimar era. Uh, featuring John Malkovich as Nosferatu film director F.W. Murnau and Willem Dafoe as the movie star who takes method acting to an unprecedented level. The movie is Shadow of the Vampire. And please welcome director E. Elias Marriage to tonight's Century Guild Salon. Hello. Hello. It's nice to join the two of you. I enjoy always spending time with the both of you and having these conversations. You moved uh, to the living room. I did. I did. I could. <laughs> I could move. I could move up to the library, but it's with uh, the salt circle and the uh, <laughs> the tomes whispering. Too much. Yes. Too much in the microphone. Too much whispering. Too many books. Too oh. many books up there. <laughs> <laughs> so the uh, the thing that we were thinking that we would do tonight is usually we have a PDF and and we kind of walk through it but the thing that uh that i thought would be more interesting i mean actually i'll start with this so the the magazines uh of der orchidine garden uh were published in germany from 1919 to 1921 and it was a convergence of a lot of european um writers and artists and, and especially germany but a lot of hungarian and russian and the thing that was most notable when I first discovered this series um, is that a lot of the authors had been celebrated. Like there's uh, the writer who invented the term robot is someone who was in the book. Uh, the author who invented the idea of the bad seed, which has been in numerous horror novels. That was an Orchid Garden author as well. But no one had really uh, explored the artworks. And the thing about the artworks and, and what we've done in our book series, and the last one will be coming out in a month or two, uh, is we wanted to, to document all of the artworks. And it's just, a, so the, the point I was trying to get to is it's a very bizarre convergence of humor and existential angst and just bizarre terror. And the, the reason that that happened uh, is because that was the gestalt of what was happening after the First World War, especially in Germany. And so when when we were thinking about, Kat, Kat yesterday said, oh, we need to, to take a half an hour and figure out if there's anything you want to make sure that we go over. And I was like, it's such an enormous, enormous subject. And if you look at the, how many books have we published so far? Is it eight? Seven. 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 Each artist has its his own great story and each author and all of that. And I thought, but you know what's really interesting is, is the psychology of the supernatural and the way that that burst through the surface right after the First World War. And of course, that's the advent of expressionism. And I thought, you know who I talk to about this constantly is you, Elias. <laughs> so I texted yes. Elias late last night and said, do you want to come talk about this? So instead of getting into details about any of the artists or any of the stuff from the Orchidine Garden, the thing that I thought would be cool is for me to, you know, to ask you a few questions and we can kind of communally talk about this. But 
you know, one of the things that I know just from knowing not just your work, but your interest in, in life and everything is before. So do you remember the first time you saw expressionist art? I'll, let me preface this by saying I never liked expressionist art until I saw a documentary on the early 20th century. And they showed how beautiful all of the artwork was from all of these young artists. And mm. then they went away to war. And then their beautiful lines of drawing nature didn't convey the terror of being shelled. And so people like Albin Grau, who did all the designs for Nosferatu, he was on the front and talks about that they used to tell the you know, the, I don't want to say ghost stories because they took them as serious. The idea mm. that, you know, there were things that were metaphysical that were happening uh, in the world. And so I'm just wondering, so that was, that was my transition was a documentary understanding the way that the war reflected uh, in art. But so do you remember when you first saw your first expressionist artwork? Yeah, 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 yeah. Uh, I, I think I was quite young. Um, it was around 12 or 13 years old, and it was at MoMA in New York City. And, um, and I, remember, I remember, you know, the fun part of that museum, of the Museum of Modern Art, was the surrealists, you know, looking at Max Ernst, looking at, you know, uh, you know, looking at, you know, Joseph Cornell's collages, you know, that had these cosmological maps and found out. As, as most 12 year olds do. As <laughs> <laughs> That's why I left and you're like, I you was know. 12 years old at MoMA. I was like, okay. Yeah. No, no, no. I, you know, it was, you know, this stuff is arresting when you're young, you yeah. know? I mean, it's, it's arresting now. I mean, right. if you, if you're not exposed to it and you're suddenly, put in front of uh, Edward Monk, you know, I, I came to Edward Monk later after I discovered surrealism first and was fascinated by that. Um, but that naturally took me to, uh, you know, guys like Monk, uh, whose portrayals and then, you know, um, you know, we talked about Nick Uccioni. Well, his father purchased a Van Gogh. And, and so that was the first time I ever saw a Van Gogh was in in their new house and that had nothing to do with reality it was a bending of light and color and architecture in a way that could only exist in the imagination and that's when I really intimately started to consciously begin to realize that that there that the way we feel things internally is different from the way we see them with ocular vision. So, you know, there, there's these two different, there's these very different worlds of the internal imagination and the emotional experience of what it is we're looking at and feeling that begins to shape and change the image itself. And, and that's what I found so appealing about expressionism. And I would say also impressionism had you know, a very subtle effect in like, you look at like George Seurat's sort of almost pointillistic use of color so that as you get close, you know, when you get closer, you can't see anything, but then when you move far away from the painting, suddenly, you know, um, it's a woman in a, with a parasol by a lake in a park and it's quite beautiful and, and it's scintillating and it vibrates with, with life. Um, and so, so I, that was my first experience, just to answer that question. And a lot of the the artists that you mentioned, like the the Van Goghs and the Surratts, that was a reaction to the artists like Gustave Moreau, right? The mm -hmm. super super hyper realistic. And then people were saying, well, how do you? What is what does an apple feel like? You know, mm -hmm. like what is that? And the fact that they were, you know, out of their minds, just looking at the ocean, like what if I just put blue paint on the mm -hmm. canvas mm -hmm. and doing that kind of thing. But so then, you know, as far as, because this, this isn't something I think maybe you and I have ever talked about, but when you think about, it's almost like impressionism is kind of this very optimistic view of the world. Like, how do you right. take what's beautiful and essentialize it? And then expressionism is such an opposite, which is now 
you know, you had the Napoleonic Wars were like 15 years. You had these battles and things that mm. seemed big, but mm. the death in World War I was unprecedented. It was something like Germany was losing like 1,300 soldiers a day. Mm. And so it's, well, it's like a dark side version of Impressionism. When well, do you World, World War I, I'm sorry to interrupt, Tom, but no, World ahead. War I was unprecedented because of its mechanical you know nature you know you had you had the use of you had the use of metal tanks you know instead of horses you know and and you, and you had old warfare i mean i think poland was fighting on horseback you know with swords and then these tanks would be rolling over the muddy hills and it was just this clash of the future and and the present and the past all all in one battlefield and and um you know, and then you had chemicals too. The use of chemical warfare, mustard gas, and and, and all of that was uh, was like a terrifying introduction to the world that we've inherited today. You know, this also does make me think about there are things in the orchid garden stories where the machinery comes to life. There's different mm. things, and I hadn't thought about this until you just said that. But the idea that technology could be in and of itself a horrifying thing mm -hmm. is very present in a lot of these stories. And I never connected that until you just said that, but that makes well, perfect sense. Well, th think about the machine gun. I mean, just the words, yeah. machine gun. Yeah. It's no longer a revolver. It's no longer a rifle. It's a machine gun. So that in and of itself is a terrifying, you know, concept. And, you know, the idea of, of, you know that we started you have the invention of the car which which introduced people to speed you know that suddenly you're you know you're moving faster than a horse can yeah. run and uh and then you have the airplane you know where suddenly you're above the earth for the first time and you're flying faster than both a horse and a car and so you have velocity you have speed and now you have the rapidity of of death in the machine gun and in chemical weapons and you know and you know and then you have you know so so what i'm saying is that i mean look at now the the world we're in a hundred years later from the orchid garden and and you know when someone when we send a text if someone doesn't answer us back in three seconds we're like insulted or you know we don't <laughs> you know we don't know what to make of it you know and yeah. So, so the, the idea of speed and the idea of the world, you know, people losing patience, you know, like the idea of sitting through reading some of those great 19th century novels like Moby Dick or whatever. I mean, I don't know anyone today that would sit through a thousand pages of a fictional novel, you know, unless they had to read it for a thesis or something like that. But yeah, yeah everybody wants rapid, fast, you know, everything. Fast love, fast death fast, you know, food, you know, fast cars, fast everything, you know, they want to, you know, if, if, if you could get from here to Europe in an airplane in an hour, everybody would be online for that, you know? Yeah. It's like, There's another thing that really stood out to me when I was working on these books, which is that I would start with, you know, we, we were basing it around the art, but to give context to the art, I was trying to put some of what the story that backed the art up was, but also the biographies of the artists and the writers. And one of the things that really affected me, and I'm curious what your take is on this, and this also is interesting because I've never asked you about this. One of the things is you would have the writer of a story and the artist working together in 1920. And then as, you know, those were the years that a lot of the what later became the Third Reich was taking root. And so some of these creative people went on to very high positions in that structure. Mm -hmm. And then other people wound up in concentration camps. Mm -hmm. And so the thing is, like, imagine for most people, if you were reading a comic book today and the penciler and the writer that you fast forward 10 years and one of them is pointing a gun at the other one that that's really not anything that 
any of us, especially as Americans, have any frame of reference for. Mm. And so I just was wondering what you thought about, like the fact that they were all in this cauldron and that what the direction that they went with it is some of them thought I should pursue metaphysics and spirituality. And some people thought I should pursue the occult and totalitarianism, that it was the same cauldron, but they had just such wildly different courses out of it. Yeah. I mean, it's intoxicating. With the question you're asking is, is massive. Um, because, you know, you trace it back to the 19th century with the uh, esoteric movements uh, that were happening, you know, with, you know, uh, Madame Blavatsky, with the Golden Dawn, um, and with Aleister Crowley, you suddenly let loose traditions, traditions that were previously esoteric, that were, you know, well hidden, and majority of people knew nothing about, you know, suddenly became, began to breach the surface of those silent waters of the esoteric world and become more widely known through Theosophical Research Society and, uh, and, and Blavatsky and the Golden Dawn. And many of them were artists, you know, I mean, you have to remember that people like William Butler Yeats and uh, Ezra Pound, you know, Ezra Pound, who was uh, Yeats's secretary at the time and edited most of Yeats's poet poetical works, you know, they were heavily involved with the Golden Dawn. And um, so the arts and esotericism were basically proliferating very, you know, and flowering very strongly up until you know, Steiner's period, you know, in the late teens and, and into the twenties. And so, so you have this path, you know, you have this, let me, uh, let me recalibrate here because there's one thing that I want to say, which is that you have a choice in the 19th century where all of these esoteric ideas are being let loose out into Western thought. And the idea was Blavatsky certainly believed this, and so did the Golden Dawn, that they were heralding in a utopian 20th century, that the next century would be fantastic, that it would be full of esoteric knowledge, Eso you know, knowledge of herbs, of healing, of alchemy, of being able to, you know, you know, give people better medical treatments, because you had this enlightened group of people that were proliferating all of these, you know, alchemical ideas that were brought from Paracelsus on up into, you know, more modern times. You had, you had mesmerism that was influencing, you know, uh, you know, uh, Freud, you know, I mean, Freud's theories wouldn't be what they are about the unconscious without mesmer and without uh, the people around him and without Nietzsche. But without spilling out too far, what I wanted to say is that you know, you have to remember that the insignia that was used, uh, uh, the symbol, you know, on, on every book and on the Theosophical Publishing uh, Company, uh, on the spine and in the title pages, you had the Theosophical Society and you had this swastika. Yeah. So the swastika is this ancient, you know, Indo-European symbol of, uh, you know, of the equinoxes of spring and winter and the cycles of uh, of the earth and agriculture and and of life itself, but you you know and you have like like a young a young Hitler you know that is exposed to this before World War One. He's exposed to Theosophy. He's <clears throat> exposed. He's exposed to Nietzsche. He's exposed to you know some of the writings that are coming out. The uh, the explosive discovery of the unconscious and all of this. And then he goes into World War One gets severely injured, gets many, you know, gets a, a, a horrendous head injury that, um, you know, puts him on different painkillers for the rest of his life. And, um, and what I'm getting at is that you had this razor's edge where suddenly you have a flowering of all this esoteric 
you know, uh, material that is being available for the first time to Western culture. And the, that availability, it was thought at the time in the late 19th century that this would lead the 20th century into a utopian period of, of greatness, you know, which I, which I think is expressed a lot in Metropolis. You know, mm -hmm. you know, you get into Fritz Lang's Metropolis later on, which is arguably an expressionist work. Um, and it explores this, you know, this utopian idea of mechanization, but also, uh, you know, the, the pitfalls of that as well. And, um, so anyway, the 20th century became one atrocity after the next. And, and, but it was influenced by this kind of positive, the positive turned into a negative. The positive influence of this esoteric work was then used for all upside down and backward reasons, you know, in the 20th century. And, and the Third Reich, I mean, there's a lot there in terms of the esoteric roots, the, um, the occult roots, you know, of, of, of what late, you know, what became the Nazi party, you know, in the thirties. Um, but I, I don't want to veer off from what it all is. Conversa all conversation, all roads lead to Hitler. When, as they say that on the internet, if you talk long enough, it eventually. Yeah. <laughs> well, <laughs> well, I mean, a lot of, a lot of the expressionist films were portending towards that, you know, we're almost predicting what was yet to come. I mean, certainly yeah. Caligari is very famously talked about the cabinet of Dr. Caligari as an expressionist work is, is talked about as the, the rise of, of that, this kind of like evil shadow in, uh, in Germany and, uh, and the third Reich. But um, one thing I'll, I'll point out just in case anyone doesn't know is that in world war one, people were using swastikas as a good luck charm. And so they would send it to their sons, their husbands, their uncles, their nephews that were in combat. And so everybody was wearing this. So when people say, well, how did Hitler come to the symbol? It was he was smart enough to look and see that what all the military men were wearing on their lapels was the swastika and him adopting it was his way of ingratiating himself to them. Uh, in terms of the fact that, yeah, like when he put that on his flags, everybody already had the pin in their closet and were mm. already wearing it. And he knew that by siding with the military minds, the ones who, because something that happened in, in the First World War is that they were telling everyone we're winning the war mm, right. when they weren't. And so they felt very sold out by their leadership. Uh, and mm. his idea was basically telling the... Um, you know, the military men, I won't steer you wrong. And of course we know how that turned out, but yeah, that's, that was why, why the swastika was there. But what about, so Nosferatu is, uh, I mean, you probably, you must know more about that movie than probably many people on the planet because of how much you had to have your, your head in it. Like how much do you feel that well i mean what are your thoughts on that it, it being that that's part of that horror mystical occult mindset that was coming out of weimar germany what was Ooh. i well you know alvin grau was the producer of nosferatu and the production designer of nosferatu and um and a, a student he, of crowley right well he was a student of crowley but he was so much more than that i mean he was very dear friends, very close friends with Alfred Kubin, you know, um, who was very influential at that time with, with his, his artwork. But, yeah. but, you know, Grau was an esotericist who believed that, that the arts were a place to infuse images for occult reasons, that to create images for occult reasons to, to transform the viewer. In a better in a better way, you know that he he hoped that it's it's almost like um, um, homeopathic medicine where mm -hmm. you give somebody like a little bit of poison in order to cure them and and I and Grau was operating very similarly when he when he was very passionately creating uh, Nosferatu. The idea was to create the poison, the vampire. Look at the shadow 
Look at his face, look at his features, look at his gestures. And by doing so, you no longer are afraid of it. You know how to deal with it. You know how to confront it. You know how to uh, o- overpower it. You know, you is, is that, it. And do you mean that like in a Jungian way? Like no. internal or is it cultural? I, I, I think it's more cultural, okay. you know, more, more cultural. And, um, but I also mean it in a magical way. Yeah. You know, the, the idea of, you know, it's almost like a Nosferatu, in some ways, I, I believe I'm making a major leap in conjecture here. So, you know, <laughs> but I, I believe that Grau believed that, that Nosferatu was more than a film, that it was actually a kind of medicine against the darkness that, that brought things like World War I about. Okay. And the only way to expiate the terrors, the trauma, the PTSD of World War I was to make Nosferatu and get rid of it once and for all. And hopefully that would lead to a more harmonious rest of the 20th century. You know, but as we know, a few years later, that didn't happen. The opposite yeah. happened. I, the, the question that, I mean, of course, there's no real answer to it, but it makes me think about, does that say something kind of to the, the futility then of that practice? Like, I'm just thinking about, or is it kind of a side effect of, um, like, I'm thinking about why, like, something like the Orchid Garden was popular. And it's like, oh, because people wanted that liberation. The films like Opium and Nervin, where, you know, it was so shocking and it was kind of like a visceral release after the tensions of the war. So I wonder with what you're talking about, like, you know, does it, I wish that the end to that story was, and he made this movie and then the 20th century was a golden age. <laughs> right. 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 Well, I, I think that there were a lot of great minds that believed the golden age would be, in the 20th would happen in the 20th century but i think there were too many genies that came out of the bottle you know yeah. Um, yeah. I, I you know you have an explosion at the end of the 19th century with with freud with victor tausk who really was very influential with freud he was both a colleague and a student of freud's but he had you know he was able to connect um mental illness with the rise of a mechanized age. And, you know, mm. this was something that Freud never thought of before, but then took on uh, on his own, you know, later on. Now, Tausk, unlike Freud, fought in World War I on the front and uh, came back completely traumatized, and but came back also from World War I with great insights into the human psyche, having seen people, you know, killing each other you know, hand to hand yeah. in the mud, in, in their own, you know, uh, slime and, 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 and sickness. And he came back and he shared these things with Freud that were very illuminating for Freud. Unfortunately, Tausk, uh, instead of being recognized as the genius that he was, uh, he wound up killing himself uh, shortly after his return from World War I. Um, he found it difficult to cope uh, after 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 that experience but so you have the explosion of the discovery of the unconscious you have you know these you know you 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 just have so many things happening all at the same time that you know and then you have the mechanization the industrialization of warfare of death you know um you know and which which then comes to its peak and its pinnacle in the concentration camp where you have the steam engine and trains, you know, bringing people en masse to these camps. And then you have, you know, the use of chemicals, of cyanide and, 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 and different chemicals to kill people faster. Um, and, you know, things that just didn't, weren't imaginable in the 19th century. So I just think there was just too, too many good things that were popping up that, you know, human beings are fragile. They can't handle too much at once, you know, Um, which is why I always like walking to a place rather than taking a car or or a train, because 
Mm. You know, when you walk a city, you understand it and you you become familiar with it in in a very profound way. Whereas when you drive around it, you're just really a passenger, literally. And and so I think the 20th century in a lot of ways was that, you know, the the, the discovery of the atom, you know, and everything. All, all these things were great things. But, you know, human beings, for the most part, are, you know, pretty savage. And so if you put something... Yeah. <clears throat> If you put something extraordinary in most people's hands, they they abuse it. Um, but but I mean that's like the whole Frankenstein myth, right? Where we all you know we have to create, so we create, and then we figure out later that we need to uh, modulate our creations, otherwise they'll eat us. Yeah, there's yeah. been a lot with social media. There's uh, I think his name's Tristan Harris. And he, he, they did a documentary and he's got an institute that's for social media studies. And they're looking at all of the things that these technologies can do, mm. but because they're attached to monetization, that it keeps like racing down the brainstem mm. into just how to get people's attention. But he's, uh, the people that he's pulled together, are like the man who invented the like button and all of these things. And they're, they're trying to, find ways to recontextualize the technology mm. in a way that actually serves us instead of turns it, you know, turns us into these vegetative D dopamine addicts. Yeah. You know? Yeah, exactly. So, you know, that's so the interesting pointing part is just that it's, that it's not better. You know, the more technology goes up, it's like, we just get, yeah. You know, I think about that all the time with, uh, you know, things like we got hit, obviously with this pandemic that they had a hundred years ago right and in in this star trek way it should have been this beautiful utopian mm -hmm. transcendence of technology transcending right. death and uh you know we just we act like cavemen with it yes and so it's just yeah so it, the fact that that happened in world war one and then a hundred years later it's just like we think yeah. we master one thing and then it's something else no, we go in cycles. We just have different technologies to deal with these things, you know. And yeah. I mean, if we didn't have the internet, we wouldn't be much different from, you know, a hundred years ago. And yeah. but but back to expressionism, uh, you know, you I think expressionism is 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 actually the canary in the coal mine in a way, where it's recognizing that the human nervous system is being exposed to so many new inventions and technologies that it's so overwhelming yeah, the stimulus. that, it, that it's, it's overstimulating and it's, it's terrifying. Yeah. It's, it's both mesmerizing and terrifying. And I think that you start to see that with like, you know, we, you know, everything from, you know, uh, you know, Edward Monk to, you know, Otto Dix. I mean, uh, you've seen Otto Dix's paintings from World War One. you know, where he, he would, uh, you know, he, he did drawings and, and little sketches of, of people that were injured and they're, they're gorgeous, but they're horrifying and they're heartbreaking, you know, at the yeah. same time. I'm sorry to interrupt you, Elias. I just, Forrest asked a great question here and I, I think it's, it fits in appropriately. I'm curious about the interface between silent films of the time, like Dr. Caligari, student of Prague, the Golem, and the artistry in their Orchidine Garden. Did they play off of each other at all? One thing I can say is I, I, I brought up from the library downstairs, I brought up a few books from Germany from the time it's gorgeous. Just to kind of show that the the aesthetics of you know that weird Ooh. the the idea that that things that were that dark could be so mainstream uh, is pretty universal. You know, there's so much of it that kind of has that, and so I can speak at least on the orchid garden side. Ooh. That the, the people who were working on that, I think, were part of the same mindset, but they I, I don't see in the Orchid Garden people who were also working in film. It's It was very separate at that time. 
in the sense that illustration art was kind of its own thing. I mean, I think now if you're a great illustrator, the movie industry would tap on your shoulder. Whereas mm. at that time, I, you know, it was still very early in the mm. history of cinema. Um, do you want to comment at all, Elias, though, on the fact that there was yeah. some art that happened that was light and flowery, but the mm. fact that so many things were being devoured by the public. When like, I when I was Caligari. when I was so doing, I'm, I'm sorry, Tom. No, no. Go ahead. When I when I was doing research on Murnau, um, one of the things that struck me, you know, quite beautifully was that Murnau was deeply influenced by painting. That that paintings and illustrations and art were very important for Murnau's compositions, the kind of mood that he was looking for in certain scenes and with certain films. And uh, so I, you know, I think at that period of time that, you know, certainly film was such a new art form that no one was really taking it that seriously yet. So it really was an amalgam of like, what is it? Is it theater? Is it photography? You know, uh, uh, you know, is it, it, you know, is it staging? Is it, you know, and so you have people like Murnau coming out of like the Reinhardt, you know, world of theater and, um, and Reinhardt, you know, was very particular about lighting and creating these arch atmospheres, you know, in his theatrical productions. And I think that spills over to a lot of, you know, to like Murnau's Sunrise and you certainly see it in his Faust and in, in Nosferatu. Um, but I, I do think there was a much more cross pollination between the visual arts and, and film because film again was, no, no one knew where to categorize it. I mean, again, putting on a theater production in London was way more prestigious than making a film. And that's why Nosferatu lost in court. You know, uh, you know Nosferatu was an adaptation of Bram Stoker's uh, Dracula, and in 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 court in England, they um, they deemed that uh, the Stoker estate had the rights to reserve Dracula for the theater, not for film. So they found that uh, Alban Grau and and Murnau had uh, you know had had illegally you know you know taken this copyright, and so they ordered the the negative burned to. Uh, to Nosferatu. Now, the only reason why Nosferatu exists today is because of a, an, an extant print that was left in, in France that was then used to make another internegative from. But, um, but you know, it's, it's interesting. And it bankrupted Murnau, didn't it? It did. Or, or, it did. a company or something? It did. I mean, the name of the company was Prana Films, which is from the Sanskrit of the breath of life. And that was Alban Grau's, of course, idea, who was deeply interested in, um, you know, Buddhism, the Indian religions, and um, and Hinduism, and and um, and Sanskrit. But um, but what I wanted to say is that um, um, it's just to me, it's just it's it, you you have to remember that that film was not yet a respected, you know, art form. So I think people who were working in film at that time were very interested in the literary side of things and in the artistic side of things because they wanted to give credibility to their own art <laughs> so did they know, make so money though like I, I think about sommeliers was a magician right who then figured out how to use the camera to do that and we think about like art and i shouldn't say art we think about film today and as you and i have discussed ad nauseum 99.9% .9 of everything is based on selling toys and based on this culture of yep. money. Yep. But when you think about where movies were shown at the turn of the century, it was in a bar. It was a spectacle kind of thing. Mm. Did, did, did someone like maybe not a Murnau specifically, but were they, were they achieving wealth or were they more the way we would think today of someone that was like a theater person or do you know what I mean? Yeah, no, they weren't, they weren't, they weren't achieving wealth. They were able to live on, 
you know, I, I think that Murnau was doing much better when he was doing theater in the Reinhardt with the Reinhardt group. Okay. And it was after that, that it was, it was really the new adventure of, of film. And when, when Murnau came to Hollywood, I think he felt that he had steady work with the studios. The studios were trying to build this, you know, the studios were trying to copy factories, you know, like factories were so successful, like building cars and building things that, mm -hmm. you know, the original, you know, the early studio system was trying to emulate guys like Henry Ford, <laughs> you know, like, okay, let's get a, a stable of writers and directors and actors and, and let's just churn these things out, you know? But so and why do you think then that someone like, cause I'm thinking about the lineage from Melies to Murnau. So then why do you think that at that point in time they were, well, there's two parts to this question. Do you think that they were letting them do art or do you think that it's just that we look at it through the lens of history and say, oh, the student of Prague, what a beautiful artistic film. But to them, was that the equivalent of a Fast and the Furious movie? No, I think it was a different mindset. I, I, you know, that kind of, the Fast and the Furious mindset, I just, I don't think it. I just I mean like they, entertainment, meaning like. Yeah, 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 they, yeah, yeah, yeah. Or do you think that they, the reason well, I'm asking. You have to remember the, the audience, Tom, back then, was more literate, you know? Right. I mean, how many people do you know today that are reading like books all the time and, you know, watching movies? Yeah, I mean, most... I love, I'm so proud of my son that he reads at the dinner table, he reads in the yeah. bathtub, he reads everywhere. Well, <laughs> I love it. You know, yeah, I love that. I love that yeah. too. That, but I, I know that, how it's rare encouraging. it is. Yeah. That's fantastic. But that's what I mean though, is knowing that it's a more literate population was something like the student of Prague the equivalent of maybe a modern suspense film or something to them? Or do you think the reason I guess that what I'm trying to get to, and I'm not articulating it well, is the idea that if they're if it's a factory universe that's trying to make these kind of movies, normally that's trying to monetize. And do you think that it's just that it was kind of I don't want to say unmonitored, but that like I, the, I would have to pause you there and just yeah. say you have to put your mind in that mindset of the moving image at that time. The moving image was such a startling, spectacular experience okay. that that it didn't matter almost what you filmed. Yeah. It was mesmerizing. It was uncanny. It freaked people out. There were a lot of people up until the mid to late twenties that thought, um, you know, cinema was sorcery form of black magic and that there needed to be exorcisms to put a stop to, I mean, you know, seriously, it's like mm. that, that it was considered a very uncanny, strange and spectacular experience to see a moving image. So like the student of Prague, the idea, the idea of like double exposure, a doppelganger, you know, and, you know, uh, these things taking place, like not only transfixed the audience, but blew them the fuck away, you know, like completely. Yeah. You know, it, I mean, it was I, like, it's like, I guess it's, it would be like seeing the Matrix in 1999, you know? I mean, um, I'll, I'll say this, not, I don't want to go off too far on this tangent, but I will say that that was my personal experience when I watched your film Begotten Projected was that I felt like I was looking at a Munch painting. I know, I think I told you this right after I saw it. Yes. And that I was watching like the silver droplets move across the screen or something. So I, I do understand what you're saying they must have had as an experience because I was looking at it thinking, I don't even understand how this is happening right. visually in a projected way. Right. But when, so when do you think, when did it change? When, when did commercialism overtake the creativity? Hmm. I Maybe. think when this, I think after the 1970s, I don't know if I'm going okay. too far ahead to, or would it have been this, I, 40s? No, I would say this, I, I'd say the seventies, you still had art. You still had things happening in cinema that 
weren't all about the bottom line. They were exciting. They were adventurous. They were able to be okay. done for lower budgets. Um, you know, things like Easy Rider in the in the late '60s. You know, were yeah. made for not you know for very little few few dollars. You know, and and into the '70s. You know, things like The Vanishing. You know, um, I, I guess The Vanishing. I, I don't know if I'm getting the title right, but you you had you had like Paramount and uh, and Warner Brothers. You know, they were being run by artists. They were being run by you know, actors and writers and people that knew what it was like to get a film made, you know? Now now it's like Universal, I mean, Universal used to be run by like GE and you'd have executives come in from yeah. New York and other parts of the country that knew nothing about storytelling, but thought <clears throat> that by, by throwing money at something that, you know, that pays for the movie star, that pays for the writer, that pays for the director. But, you know, we all know that you could have all the money in the world and you can make a real garbage film and you can have no money and you can make a really extraordinary film. Um, yeah. And, you know, so it, the mindset of just trying to make the absolute most amount of money is kind of like the Facebook mentality of wanting the most amount of likes on, on a post that you put up, you know, it's yeah. just, it's just this mindless dopamine fix that, that uh, that studios are after, that you know, that that everybody seems to be chasing, and it's just a, it's just an empty circle, you know. Well, I'll tell you how I personally am chasing that, and that's with the publishing of tangible books. Well, because you know it's popular. The tell me, word. No, I'm just kidding. But <laughs> <laughs> I was, you know, instead of right being now, on my, TikTok, we're like my, printing my, my books. You can't and... see it, but I have like these synapses behind my forehead that were exploding. <laughs> it's like what? Yeah. yeah. I have I mean, to tell important. you, Tom. I love what you and Century Guild and Cat are doing with with the you know not only the 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 Orchid Garden you know, publication, but La Pater is like, is a masterpiece. It's like a really beautiful piece of printed uh, beauty, really. And the, the writing in it and the images and everything, the way it's put together is just awesome. And, oh. and that kind of printing, that kind of bookmaking is for the large part, very, you know, few and far between. So congratulations. I thought I had a copy of the soft cover here. Because there's a, there's a beautiful Elias marriage quote on the back. <laughs> I don't know where they are. It's messy here. Well, I'm honored to have my name on that book of yours. So thank you. So I let's are there has anybody asked any questions? Normally we have a ton of questions and everybody's just been really quiet. <laughs> this I think that's, everybody that's because I'm, been, I'm your guest. Yes, everyone's <laughs> just completely arrested by the conversation. Understandably. Um, Sean said at some point, great point, Thomas. What point that is, I'm not sure. Um, and then continue. Oh, when I was, I was talking about the fact that the artists working on the Orchid Garden were, were, were is so contrary in their core beliefs that a decade later they were literally killing each other. Oh. And mm -hmm. Elias, he mentions that Murnau was gay and socialist and Emil Jannings uh, wound up supporting the Nazis. And mm. that's something that one of the founders of the Orchid Garden um, was heavily invested in the occult. And mm. he wound up getting introduced to Goebbels and that circle and all of that and just riding that social ladder all the way up. And then it's just so bizarre. One of the, the people became in charge of the large public spectacles that the Nazis did. And you look at their beautiful drawings and you think that became their sketches for mm. these big public Jugend events, you know, the, the Hitler. Yeah, Jugend. I mean, the, the Nuremberg rallies and Triumph of the Will, a Triumph of the Will in many ways. I remember watching that when I was, you know, a student when I was uh, in art school. And I, I thought that that felt like an expressionist piece, you know, those yeah. very high angles and these, you know, when you see the three of them walking between half a million, you know, soldiers perfectly lined up, that, that took on, um, it felt like an Otto Dix, uh, you know, somehow of, uh, you know, some of his 
his his work but uh it's let me ask you know. this because you're a guy that loves really wacky comedies <laughs> no, the, so the thing that i'm thinking one of the things that it, that to me is entertaining in the orchid garden is it's got that grand guignol idea of where they try to give you a laugh right and use that to escalate the terror um is that something that i mean do you have any thoughts on that as far as well, I'm going to leave it wide open because I know you and Joel. <laughs> I, I, you know, the, if you want, you know, you could spend an entire conversation talking about the origins of laughter. I mean, you know, laughter itself, as we've seen in different films and in, is, is a very creepy thing. I mean, if you look at like someone like Edgar Allan Poe, who I'm sure influenced many of the writers that, that wrote in the orchid garden they also um, translated some of his stories for the orchid garden that's mm -hmm. the way that a lot of german readers were probably introduced to him wow okay okay well laughter in poe i mean I, i've never seen a doctoral dissertation on that but i would almost want to write it myself if, if i had the time to really do that but you know you look at like the telltale heart and um the way laughter plays out in that, it's the most terrifying thing. And I would say that that laughter comedy comes out of horror. Uh, you know, I mean, I know that's like a broad brush stroke generalization, but for the sake of yeah, the time that. we have here, but I, I, do, I do really believe that the best laughter and, you know, unfortunately comedy has been stilted by, you know, people being afraid of being offended, you know, but that's, that's the beauty of great comedy is that, yeah. is that it is, it is transgressive. It is offensive. It is, you know, uncanny in, 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 in at its best. But, but what I was going to say is that I think that, um, like the best comedy comes sincerely out of, out of tragedy, out of horror. Um, and, uh, you know, so, so it doesn't surprise me that the Orchid Garden stories are blending this idea of like setting up a laugh just before, you know, the, you know, the guy's smiling just before he turns and gets hit by a train or something, you know. Um, the other thing that, that I notice a lot in the stories is that they, um, they get, there's two things that happen. One is that some of them get just really, really, really crazy in their sensibilities of being disconnected from reality. Mm. And if you want to know what that means, you can look at the books. But another one is like there's one story, and I think it's a Hungarian author. And it's got a bunch of men seated at, at a dinner table. Mm -hmm. <clears throat> and they're trying to they're arguing over what would be the best way to die. Mm. Meaning like, oh, and if this happened, this would be dramatic. And and they just they're talking about it and then one of them keels over face down dead at the table <laughs> and then the last line is like and all the other diners were jealous like there's <laughs> no real narrative to it it's just like this weird little lump of yeah. misery and it's just such a funny it just feels very it's just so nasty and funny you know it's but it like... feels it, it's just so un-american i guess the thing is like we look at weird tales yeah which is the first american pulp that delved into horror and science fiction and the sensibility is so based in narrative whereas it's, the european ones are based in mood like they're just right. trying to give you a mood and then they're out and it's like there was no story there it was just yep a sentiment mm -hmm. and so that's that was something also that as a as someone who loves story that stood out to me is yeah. that the european sensibility was no that's true and it's it's uh you know but the artwork that i've seen in your books is so incredible i mean it's both you know it, it's erotic it's it's meditative it's uh, sublime and let me do this because we've just got a couple minutes left there's yeah. a couple of questions yeah as far as what the goals of the editors and how it was received, because some people have asked about that, Forrest and Sean. Uh, the answer is, I don't know. Uh, some of these, I think, 
I thought maybe one of the books I had here was so the two men who made the Orchid Garden, they were both authors themselves. And so I think that kind of in the way that maybe you're a musician and then you start booking bands or things like that, that I think that they started this magazine because it was their community. Um, and I think that I, I don't know how it was specifically received any better than telling you that they went out of business after two and a half years. So I think that it did well because the, uh, you know, the publication numbers skyrocketed, but by the last year it was gone, but also the Deutschmark completely collapsed uh, yeah. at that time. So people were using wheelbarrows of money just to get a loaf of bread. So I, I think that the magazine broke under that. Mm. But there's a question here from the very smart Charles Schneider that I think is a good question for you, Elias. Um, how do you feel uh, black and white decadent artists inspired expressionist cinema? And do you wish black and white was a much more filmic choice? I guess meaning like more common that it was utilized more today. Oh, wow. What a great question. Um, I love that question. I, I, I feel that black and white is definitely purely cinematic in the sense that, you know, most of us see the world in color. And when you see a world in cinema, in cinematic black and white, you, it, it creates like a lens within a lens through which you can examine certain moods, certain expressions, certain gestures in ways that you would miss if they were in color. You know, if they were in color, you would just, your eye would be too comfortable and your eye would be too uh, lazy to really look. And black and white forces us to look deeper into an image and allow it to lead us through its shadow and its shapes and its, uh, you know, silhouettes. Uh, so, so I, that's, I, I find black and white to be a, a profound and, uh, um, superiorly cinematic use of, of image. You know, if it's, if it's done, if it's done well, I mean, obviously like if anything's done well, but yeah. you know, in its own right though, separately, I would like to just say that, uh, color has its own set of esoteric principles and used conscientiously and alchemically light and color uh, can be profound story storytellers as well you know it's 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 whenever you give a lot of thought to any element within a motion picture it it in it it gives it deeper and and more valences of meaning you know than if you just simply just shooting something without thinking about it too much, you know? I don't want to get too far off on this too, but I, I'm personally curious. When you were designed, so Polly and Blastema is, is a movie that is not out yet, um, but it's monochromatic and you've, you've got different color filters and stuff kind of that, but it's, it is solid. Did you ever consider making that in color or was it literally from the inception that you knew that it needed to be monochromatic i knew it needed to be monochromatic but i did experiment on on a couple of sequences as you saw with uh with those alien creatures in the desert yeah. you know that that was rendered in color and i i found that to be kind of beautiful in its in its own way but i felt for the overall story you know, rather than just a scene looking great, you know, that the overall yeah. story I think needed to be monochromatic because it need, there's so much going on in those images that you, you need to be led, you need to immediately be confronted by its unfamiliarity so that you can be attentive enough to really experience the entire film in its totality. You know, whereas I think in color it would just become kind of like um not as uh not lead you as powerfully or as deeply yeah i can see that i mean i can't imagine it any other way i just wondered if it was because obviously begotten 
you imagined is black and white. I'm guessing. Uh huh. Yes. Necessary part of it. So yeah, I did. I did do a color experiment after, after begotten. Actually, right at the tail end, you know, I did a color experiment on the optical printer that I had before it was dismantled and all the parts of it were given back to their respective owners. Um, but I did do this color experiment. I have to try to find it. I was I just going to say, it. where is it? <laughs> because, because it's, 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 it's really amazing. It's gorgeous. Oh. And, and it's something that I always thought, okay, I, I need, to, I need to find the right story through which to tell it in this particular kind of color, you know, um, it's almost, it almost looks like an autochrome, Tom, you'll know exactly what I'm talking oh, about. Man. You know, um, it just has this feeling like black and white, but the color is kind of blooming from behind the black and white. And it's But was so, it a chemical treatment or was it color film or what? It was, it was color film, but with black and white, you know, okay. uh, together uh, okay. being, being uh, shot separately onto the same piece of negative. Uh, so it would be a black and white image and a color image. Uh, actually, black and white negative, and a color, color positive. You know, then, then I would uh, film the two of them together, and then I would uh, uh, onto a single strand of film, so that the, the two elements would be married onto one strip of film, and then I would, um, and then I did an experiment where I hand developed that film, and that was interesting but not as interesting as when it was kept consistent by developing it at a lab you know yeah i'm gonna stop before i ask more questions cat do you want to uh <laughs> to wrangle the two children that are going to go off on tangents about I, printers i would and... be happy to as, as sad as i am for it to end um yes i mean i almost went on a tangent earlier elias you mentioned like speed limits with with velocity of cars, I just got a 1925 film on 16 millimeter. That's it was the year that they came up with uh, the speed limit, and I have not watched it yet. But it's like a public service film that's 15 minutes or whatever it is, and so it's like horses and buggies and cars, and it's talking about like death from traffic accidents and 1925. And I thought why that year did they make this yeah and the reason is because before that there weren't any speed limits and i thought well mm -hmm. that's strange and i thought well the cars didn't go fast enough like right. all of this is like we take right. it for granted but i didn't go down that tangent cat you'll notice <laughs> there, Congratulations. go all the way in <laughs> well uh, i yeah, do you have I, anything else, Kat? I, I do, yes. I, I just want to thank you both for such a thoughtful and inspiring conversation. Um, yeah, Elias, thank you for doing this. This yes. was super, super. I love you guys. Of course. We love you, love you so much. And it, it was such a pleasure. And thank you to everybody who's joined us this evening. I think we've got some new people joining us tonight, which is awesome. Um, I know I've said this before, but this really is a community endeavor and we just love being in touch with everybody who loves this material, loves art. And, um, you know, it's, it's been such a pleasure communicating about it. Um, so we, we will be announcing the topic for the next Century Guild Salon. In the meantime, I just wanted to show you guys the actual books. Ooh. So this is number one. Beautiful. That the number. covers of these magazines are all just so fantastic. Oh, they're awesome. They're so Yeah, awesome. you could spend a long time looking at a single yeah. image. Like and that's that's yeah. all we did is adapt some of the covers of the magazines. Like, mm -hmm. like you know, that's the one I'd held up earlier. They're just it's oh yeah, that's great gorgeous. Mm -hmm. And I've got here, this is one of the original paintings. Oh my god, that's but yeah, the beautiful. Art's so cool. And they're really fun to read through. I mean, fun is a weird word to use, but they're 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 inspiring. They are 
pretty entertaining. One of my favorite stories, there's a giant goose that wreaks havoc through a town. And it's you know, one of the more absurd ones, but um, I love it. Yeah. So um, you can find these all at centuryguild.net if you want to pick up a couple of them and, and just see, you know, see how you like them. And again, we will um, post an announcement for the topic of the next uh, Century Guild Salon. But for those of you joining us for the first time. Yeah, we thank you for being here. The yeah, thing that I'll you. just say is that we, when we had the gallery and in the days when we were having a lot of events, it was always nice at openings to have conversations and you'd have, mm. uh, you know, all of that. And so we're trying to, to, to recreate some of that in a, in a, in a digital medium. So uh, for people that are new here, yeah, definitely. If you look at first Thursday of every month, and if you look at the uh, book that we're going to do, definitely, if you put questions in the chat and stuff, uh, the idea is just that we're trying to not make this as much a lecture as a conversation. So uh, yeah, thank you for being here. And I'm going to turn it yes. back over to Kat, who's in charge. Yes, thank you so much, everyone, once again. And if you'd like to plan ahead, we do meet the first Thursday of every month at 6 p.m. Pacific time. So you can just mark your calendars in advance. Make sure you're here with us. And um, yes, thank you again, uh, Elias, so much for joining us. Yep, I'm marking my calendar for next month. So. <laughs> Wonderful. All right, everybody, we'll see you next time. Okay. Bye. Thank you. Bye, guys. Bye-bye.